Hello and welcome to Coronavirus Q&A. Time to get your COVID questions answered. Tonight, leading the response in Wales, Mark Drakeford, the First Minister. Professor Susan Mickey, a sage government advisor on how people behave during a pandemic. Our GP, Dr Sarah Jarvis, will answer your latest health concerns and carry on COVID. Amanda Barry shares her hair-raising lockdown stories with us. Here's how you can get in touch so you too can speak to the experts and the decision makers. All that to come first, here's what you need to know. You must now self-isolate if you have a loss of smell or taste. These symptoms have been added to the NHS official list today. Two weeks until some primary pupils could go back to school in England, but the rows about the big return go on. Scotland has announced plans to ease its lockdown from May the 28th. And in Northern Ireland, groups of up to six people not in the same household will soon be allowed to meet up outside. But we start tonight's programme in Wales with the politician in charge of what happens and when during the Covid crisis. The First Minister, Mark Drakeford, I put some of your questions to him a little earlier. First Minister, your first question comes from Tessa. She writes, would it be acceptable for me to drive my son to England from Wales to see his daughter? He's not seen her since lockdown began. Well, first of all, can I just say how much I sympathise with the personal dilemma of people who've not been able to speak to relations or be in their company during this lockdown period. In Wales, the rules are that we must stay local. So it would really depend on how far someone had to drive. If you happen to live near the border and can go into England, I guess that would be acceptable. If you're living in the far west of Wales, then the answer probably to that question would be no. We ask people to stay safe and to stay local because that way we're able to go on making sure that coronavirus doesn't spread in our communities and we do the thing we've all worked so hard to do, mm. and that is to save other people's lives. OK, so you can cross the border, according to you, if, if it is uh, in, a, in a short distance. Alison also has a question about the border. She says, how do you expect those of us who live on the border with England to listen to you when we are witnessing our English family, friends and colleagues being afforded privileges that we are being denied? Well, actually, there's only very little difference between what happens on the right uh, and left side of our border. And if you live in Wales, then you're subject to the rules that are made in Wales. And the reason that we have our rules is simple. It's not to deny anybody freedoms that we wish they could have. It is simply to continue the enormous collective effort that people in Wales have made with success to bear down on the virus, to stop its circulation. Uh, nobody is safe from coronavirus. It's a disease that can affect any one of us. And in Wales, we are taking a careful and cautious approach to it because in the long run, we're sure that that will pay dividends. There's a big difference, Mark Drayford, between the stay at home and stay alert and also meeting uh, one member of your family and friends, which you can do in England. Any date yet? For more easing of restrictions in Wales, we've seen Scotland announcing today it's aiming for next week. Well, we are on a three-week cycle. That's what the law requires us to do. So we're working this week inside the Welsh Government on a long list of potential ideas for what we might be able to do next to go on just gradually and carefully unlocking lockdown. We'll work on the long list today and tomorrow. That includes ideas that people in Wales have sent in to us. By the beginning of next week, we'll have got that down to a shorter list. Our chief medical officer will advise us on it. Okay. And by the end of next week, 
we'll be in a position to make announcements about what happens next. OK, so you're not aiming for the same date as Nicola Sturgeon. Pat in North Wales is shielding. She says, I feel as if we've been forgotten. You never discuss in your traffic light system, the system for easing restrictions, not all shielding our elderly. Some of us have jobs and families to support. Mark, what's your response? Well, I hope we don't forget people who are shielding. It's over 120,000 people in Wales. Uh, they're being asked to make a tremendous sacrifice in keeping themselves entirely away from other people in the community. But there is a very good reason for it. Uh, Pat will be in that category because she has a serious underlying health condition. And while she normally could work, coronavirus attacks people with underlying health conditions in a way that doesn't affect the rest of the community. So we ask people to make this sacrifice because this is the best way to keep them safe. Okay. And we can um, go on asking them to do it right mm. until the middle of June. Yeah, very difficult for those people in that category. Kelly wants to know, Mark, how will people go back to work if schools in Wales are not reopened? Well, schools in Wales have been open right through the coronavirus crisis for key workers, people who are going back to work. Uh, we have more children in our schools today than we have uh, earlier on in the period, and the number has risen over the last few weeks. So there are about 450 schools in Wales open. They have children of key workers. They have vulnerable children attending to them. If someone is going back to work, they should ask that school about whether their child can return and when the time is right and when it is safe to do so for pupils and for teachers we will have more children coming back into school in Wales. First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We can speak now to one of the people advising the UK government through this crisis on SAGE's Behavioural Science Advisory Group. Susan Mickey is Professor of Health Psychology at University College London and examines how we behave when it comes to our health. Susan, thank you for joining us this evening. Let's start with social distancing. Kelvin says, I find it very strange that I can only play golf on my own, yet I am allowed to go shopping in superstores where people are not keeping two metres apart. Susan, there is still some confusion this week, especially when some people seem to ignore some of the rules in some places. Hello. Um, I think there's confusion on many levels. I think there's confusion about some of what the words mean. And I also think there's confusion about how people are interpreting them. And then I also think there's confusion about how you implement them. Um, because, as you say, it's very difficult in certain situations. Um, there's also been inconsistency about people coming into homes. So the first people who are allowed into homes are nannies and cleaners and cooks and estate agents, but mm. not loved ones. So there's quite a few things that don't seem to add up to people um, in terms of the last week's messaging. Briefly, what is your advice then for people in England right now in this in-between period, I guess? Well, absolutely key outside of the home to keep at least two metres away from other people. And the more that one goes outside of the home, where there will inevitably be more risk, the more that one should really pay attention to cleaning hands before you get into buildings, um, not touching your eyes, nose or mouth, which is how the virus gets into the body, and using tissues at all times if you cough or sneeze. That way, we'll try and keep the transmission um, low enough to begin getting back into the kind of activities we all want to get back into. OK, let's turn to education. One from a uh, year 10 pupil who wants to get back to school. Uh, she or he writes, the UK government has decided to let younger children go back to school, but I don't understand why really he or she is pointing out how difficult it will be for primary school pupils to keep apart. What's your thoughts on this? I, I think absolutely right. I don't know how you keep uh, children apart. But I think if children are going to go back, it's really important, first of all, to really pay attention, obviously, to the environment and the procedures, which I'm sure teachers are doing, um, but also use it as a training for children um, as they're coming in, uh, ensure they're all given uh, tissues, show them how to use them, uh, again, sanitizers, where the hot soap and water are, and really try and begin inculcating um, habits in children, because as a population, we need to change these ha habits 
permanently um, mm -hmm. because this won't be the last virus um, that we'll encounter. Have you uh, put your concerns to the government on this issue of uh, schools returning some pupils next month? Uh, there's a separate um, advisory group looking at uh, schools and, and the whole return and the whole issues to do with schools. Um, very complicated. I think it's really important that the government works in partnership with teachers, with parents, with the representatives of teachers, which are the trade unions, because the mm. only way to deal with these very complicated issues is really to listen to the communities that understand the situation on the ground and who can come up with solutions to problems and go forward, not with um, top down edicts, but really learning together about how best to do it, because these are new situations for everyone to deal yeah, with. Yeah, for all of us, absolutely. Um, Mark uh, asks about the accountability mm. of SAGE. He argues that the UK mm. was too slow on lockdown. What's your response? Was there too much emphasis on how people in this country might not comply? As we heard from the Prime Minister early on, he said he didn't want to go to lockdown too early and not enough emphasis, perhaps, on clinical science, on biological science. I think um, when we first saw Wuhan and China locking down, uh, the general response was um, that will never happen here. But I think what we've seen is that uh, people are incredibly adaptable and sensible when they know what the level of the risk is and when they know what to do. And I think as time goes on, it's becoming clearer and clearer that the WHO advice of um, locking down quickly and instituting uh, testing and tracking and tracing and isolating and supporting people who are being isolated is really what you need to do in pandemics. Move quickly seems to be uh, really the lesson that's being learned. Susan, Mickey, uh, thank you very much for your thoughts this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back from prisons to private planes, Chris Choi will be answering all your COVID queries. Dr. Sarah Jarvis is standing by with all her expert knowledge and... Got an obsession with fringe cutting. I do it every 10 minutes, actually, to try and sort it out. It's called a lock Amanda Barry on cutting her locks, lots in lockdown.
Welcome back. Time to talk health with Dr. Sarah Jarvis. Good evening to you. Uh, can I start by asking whether you welcome the news that loss of taste and smell are now official symptoms? Yes, I do. We've known about this for several weeks, but of course, what we always need to do with these new symptoms or new treatments, anything new about coronavirus and pretty much everything has been in the last two or three months, is to learn how much difference it was going to make. So for instance, if we were having a lot of people who had loss of sense of smell and we were putting them all into isolation, but actually the vast majority of them didn't have coronavirus, then there wouldn't have been any point. What we now know is that probably by using just cough and fever, we're picking up about 91% of people with coronavirus and getting them to self-isolate. By adding loss of sense of smell, because in some people it happens early and it happens happens sometimes without fever or cough, we're picking up about 93%. So that is making a difference, albeit a fairly marginal one. Mm, great clarity there. Thank you for that. Uh, here's Mike with our first viewers question tonight. Why, after two months of lockdown, are we still getting so many new cases and deaths from coronavirus? Why? Well, I wish there were a magical solution. And frankly, if we put everybody in the entire world into a plastic bubble for four weeks, we would be able to get on top of this. But the world is not a plastic bubble and a country is not a plastic bubble. So when we talk about the R number, which is the number of people one person infects, we are relying on some people changing their behavior to get it down from two and a half or three, which it was at the start, down to half that, and then with the stricter measures to get it down below one, which is when it starts to peter out. But of course, older people, for instance, who have care needs and people with disabilities will need people to be in touch with them. Families will live together and they'll pass it on and that'll keep it going for several weeks. All of these things mean that the virus will continue. What we're trying to do is to get on top of the figures till we get them right down and then really hit hard to identify people and isolate them quickly and everyone they might have been in contact with so that we can keep those numbers down. Because one of the issues is that we can't keep everybody at home and people have been passing it on before they have symptoms. OK, uh, let's uh, talk about the people who are at home. We've had lots of questions about those who are shielding. I put one earlier to the First Minister. Let's hear another from Janet. Being in the most extremely vulnerable category and having to stay in for 12 weeks, what happens after this time? Do we just go out? I presume not. What's your advice, Sarah? No, Janet, and I do understand that people who are in the shielded category slightly feel they've been forgotten because the guidance is changing for everybody else, but not for you. But unfortunately, that is because you are in that category who are very vulnerable to getting infection and severe complications. The good news is that we are learning more about the virus and it may be that we'll be able to have some subtle nuances that we'll discover that some people who are currently in the shielded category may be at lower risk than others. And that once the cases are down and we're keeping them down, that we may be able to just ease up those restrictions slightly. In the meantime, I really hope that you're taking advantage of things like the amazing NHS volunteers who've offered to help out with people who are shielding so that you are catered for at home. OK, uh, Lee has got a question about masks. He says, I've seen a lot of posts on social media regarding the fact children will have to wear a mask when uh, they go out and about. He said he worries because his child has special needs and he wouldn't keep a mask on. Is there any truth in this he wants to know? Well, masks are not mandatory, they're recommended, and they're not recommended for anybody under the age of two. And if they are recommended in England, Scotland or Northern Ireland, but not in Wales, they are only recommended if you're on public transport and can't socially distance, or if you're indoors in some shops where you can't socially distance. So your child wouldn't need to wear them unless they were in those situations. And even then, it's not mandatory. Clearly, if a child is having problems communicating or complying, the reason we don't require children under two to wear them is for exactly that reason. So, no, he wouldn't have to. OK, Dr Sarah Jarvis, as ever, thank you very much. And uh, Dr Jarvis will answer many more of your questions straight after this programme. Now, though, it's time for Chris Choi, who's been looking through all of your questions as ever. Um, still so many about uh, social distancing. Let's uh, start with uh, this one. Uh, they didn't give us the name. You can only meet one person outdoors, but what if that person has a child or children that can't be left at home? I mean, a lot of people have been 
asking about this one. Yet you can meet somebody that's not in your household in England, providing you separate by two metres. But can that person bring along a child or a baby? When we've asked officials, they've always pointed us to the other rule, which says that there is a ban on more than two people gathering. Now, that strongly suggests that there is no exemption, not even for babies. Goodness. OK, uh, Macy wants to know, what will happen with prison visits? Will they be going ahead with PPE if everyone keeps a two-metre distance from one another? Certainly not at the moment. At present, prison visits are all suspended. What's happening instead is that some prisoners have been given special phones that enable them to, to make calls to specified numbers. Some prisons are even trialling video links and there is a special prisoners' families helpline with lots of advice and information. OK, with all the changes we've seen in the past week, Paul asks, can tradesmen now enter homes to carry out their trades? Tradesmen across the UK can go into homes providing they safe distance, uh, that they don't have symptoms, that their customers don't have symptoms, but it, it is allowable. From homes to gardens, Leslie wants to know, is it safe to have a regular gardener to tend to our garden? Uh, she says we are both isolated, aged 80 and 90. And that's what makes this such a tricky one, mm. their age and the fact that they are vulnerable. Uh, there is a guideline that says that work shouldn't happen in households that are shielding or isolated. Of course, this isn't in the household, it's in the garden, but we're talking about an older age group. And remember, it is possible for a gardener to touch something that's later touched by the householders passing on infection. You do have to be so careful. Officials have emphasised that people are shielding should not have gardeners in this way. These people are only isolating, which is a step down, so it's feasible, but only with great caution, great social distancing and a full risk assessment. OK, um, a great question here from David. Uh, where do you buy masks? How do we know they're genuine and not from a fraudulent company? Well, the government is advising mask coverings, face coverings, not the clinical masks that are used by health workers. A lot of large reputable retailers are now starting to sell them and you can make your own using things like sports socks and old tea towels. Where's Blue Peter when you need them so badly? Uh, Daniel uh, wants to know, uh, when will people in relationships that don't live together be able to start seeing or staying with each other? Quick answer for him. No set date, I'm afraid, for right. that yet. You can, you can go and see, but you can't visit, you, can't, you okay. can't stay over. OK, let's end with Ian, who I think might have quite a niche question. Am I permitted to, permitted to fly my private plane around the British Isles? There you are, the jet set are tuned in now. Yeah, okay. starting last week, uh, this kind of leisure flying was permitted once again with safe distancing, which means you need either a solo flight or a very big plane. Good news for Ian there, Chris. Thank you very much. And Chris is staying with me to uh, get even more answers for you online on the ITV News Facebook page, or you can find us on YouTube. Before we go, as promised, how Amanda Barry is coping in lockdown from frantic fringe cutting to a sunbathing disaster, starring in her very ep own episode of Carry On Quarantine. Hello, my name is Amanda Barry, and I have been around for a very, very long time. I uh, probably know me best for Coronation Street and Carry On Cleo and all oh, sorts of stuff. I've got an obsession with fringe cutting. I do it every 10 minutes, actually, to try and sort it out. It's called the Lockdown Fringe, which I've now got, and also the Lockdown Dog Haircut. Probably celebrity big brother. <laughs> because at least here, I don't have to nominate anybody. My high moments in lockdown are getting my cup of coffee in bed every morning with two biscuits and a treat for the dog and knowing that I don't have to get Well, I was sunbathing in the garden the other day and I decided I would just strip off quick. I was saying to Hillary, shall I use factor two, four, six, eight, twenty, whatever? And she didn't answer me. I thought, oh, well, you're not listening to me. Actually, I realised I had been talking to the Amazon man and I was stark naked. The thing I miss most, actually, not acting, is actually, actually laughing. Pardon me, Mrs Brenner, but I'm not sure I like your tone just now. That's your reincarnation I think it was there about 15 years. I don't remember being there 15 years because it was like being in the lockdown, really. I am quite scared at the moment as they say lockdown is over, that I might say, actually, I'm not ready for it yet, sorry. I thought we'd got a few more months. Do I, do I really have to, why might I have to work? Oh, for God's sake, I have to get up again. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, as they say. Good luck to everybody. Goodbye.
Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for all your questions. We're sorry we can't get through all of them. A question from a four-year-old coming up online in a sec. We'll be back here next Monday at 8. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Welcome to Coronavirus Q&A online. Dr. Sarah Jarvis is still with me, as is Chris Choi. Let's start uh, with a question for Sarah from Alexandra, who is four. She uh, wants to know, when will operations begin again? As she says, my daddy has no hip and is on crutches. She wants to be able to run around the garden with him. Oh, golly, I'm not surprised, Alexandra. And it will happen. Just not, it's just not going to happen straight away. So what's happening at the moment is that the, the hospitals are gradually coming back as the number of cases has gone down. Really good news. We're gradually starting to do more procedures and hospitals have been advised about two and a half weeks ago now that they need to start getting those procedures back. But unfortunately, I know your daddy's feeling very, very miserable with this, but this is not a this is not a, what we call an urgent procedure because um, it's not going to get worse very quickly if it's not done. Therefore, he will probably have to wait a little bit longer, probably a few weeks longer. And unfortunately, waiting times for things like hips are going to take some months to get back completely to normal. It'll be worth the wait, won't it, when that uh, operation finally gets carried out. Um, you mentioned uh, about children wearing masks. Alison's got a question uh, about face coverings as well. She says, I have asthma. Is it better to wear a mask in confined public spaces, even though I find it harder to breathe? I mean, so many people have asthma. What's your advice? That is a difficult one. About one in six children, one in 12 adults has asthma. Now, we do know that with a very confined mask, it can increase the amount of rebreathing so you can get more carbon dioxide in your system and less oxygen. But if you're not doing any physical exercise, it shouldn't be too bad. Clearly, make sure you have a very clean mask because any dust could definitely make that worse. And I would say that don't forget, you're protecting other people rather than protecting yourself by wearing a mask. So don't the, the, the risk to you from taking a mask off is very, very small. The risk to other people is if everybody took their masks off, would be there. But please don't put your health at risk. Take the mask off if you're feeling breathless. OK, uh, good advice. It's something we're all getting used to, isn't it? Having our uh, mouths and, and noses covered. Um, Tim has a question for you. While we are all social distancing and making sure to frequently wash hands and stop the spread of germs, are we also seeing a very large decline in some of our other more common viruses? There are lots of other viruses which are spread either by droplets or by hand, um, so the so-called fecal oral route, so tummy bugs in particular, which do seem to have dropped dramatically. Now, if we can keep this up until the winter, the good news, although we're worried about a second spike, about a second wave of coronavirus, especially in winter, because that's when flu tends to hit, we may have less of the flu. My only concern going forwards is that we do need to allow kids to build up resistance, so we need to get them back making mud pies at some point in the not too distant future. Mm, good point. Uh, Nikki has a question about care home testing. Let's listen to that. My mum's in a care home with dementia. Next week, they're going to be testing the residents and the staff for the coronavirus. What does that test actually mean? Surely the test is only valid for the day that it's tested on. What's your advice for Nikki? Okay. 
So it's a really good question. As it happens, I made a film for the Department of Health and Social Care a couple of weeks ago explaining to care home staff how to carry out those tests. This is the PCR test, the have I got it test. And what they'll need to do, you're quite right, it is only valid on the day that it's done, but when people will often be, be um, a positive and have no symptoms for two or three days after they become that the test becomes positive. So we should be able to do the test before people have symptoms and identify them really quickly and therefore get them into isolation. But those tests will need to be done regularly in order to keep on top of the virus. And certainly if a case is identified, we'll need to identify everybody around them. Goodness, it's complicated. Um, Elaine has a question about who you can and can't now see. My daughter has had COVID-19 and is now back in work. We haven't seen her for all this time. My husband and I are shielding for 12 weeks. So is it okay for her to visit us now and come to the house? Well, that's a really tough one because mm. firstly, we don't know for certain whether she's had COVID-19 until she's been tested. We know that today, of course, the announcement was made that everybody over five is now eligible for testing. The second complicating factor is even if we do know that she's been tested, we think there is a good chance that she will have some immunity, but that's not guaranteed. And certainly we don't know how long that immunity will last for. So if you're shielding, even if she's had COVID and has been tested and confirmed and has got over it, I would still be wary. But I think your chance of catching it from her is significantly reduced compared to if she hadn't been tested and found to have it in the past. OK, we've all got to exercise such uh, patience still, haven't we? Uh, Dr Sarah Jarvis, don't go away. I've still got lots more questions for you. Let me bring Chris in, though, uh, now. Um, on this issue of uh, nurseries, we've had a question. Um, our children's nursery is planning to reopen on the 1st of June, but we feel we need more information before we are happy to send the children back. We have been paying 15% of fees while the nursery has been closed, but we're worried that the nursery could charge full fees after they reopen, even if we don't send them. Does the nursery have the right to charge fees to keep the children's places? We know how hard it is to get a nursery place. Yeah, this has been an ongoing saga. Um, the government is uh, aiming towards reopening schools and nurseries on the 1st of June. Schools, of course, only for certain age groups. Now, during the problems that nurseries ha have had, and, and they've been really badly hit, of course, because so many uh, youngsters haven't been attending, the government issued guidelines using a certain phrase, urging nurseries to be fair and balanced uh, with uh, parents when it came to fees. A lot of nurseries, as we heard there, have been asking for either the full fees or a proportion. They have said it's the only way they've been able to stay afloat. Ultimately, it comes down to a matter of contract, individual commercial relations between the parents and the particular nursery. Anybody in this situation is going to have, a, have to have a chat as soon as possible with the nursery provider to find out what their policy is going to be. And only then can you decide whether you feel it's worth continuing paying in order to keep that place open. Goodness, um, a big headache for lots of people there. Sarah, if I can bring you in on the health aspect of all this, what's your advice about sending your child to school or nursery? We're talking about as, as soon as next month in England. So the big issues appear from the BMA and indeed from the Royal College of Physicians about whether or not this will increase the R number, increase the number of people getting infected. On an individual level, what we do know is that children do appear to get the virus, but on the whole, they are much, much less likely to have severe symptoms. So we have literally seen a handful under 10 children die from coronavirus compared to what? well over 34,000 adults who've died from it. So the risks to individual children are very, very low, even with this latest news we've had about this so-called multi-organ multi inflammation, which is a little bit like something called Kawasaki disease. So risks to individual children, small. Risks to teachers, probably not that great either. Really, the question is, are they then going to bring it home and give it to grandma? And that's probably more of an issue, but it's actually more a population issue in terms of how safe is it to open schools. In other words, is it going to send the case numbers spiking? So far, the evidence is probably not, but possibly. 
One of the government's reasons for bringing uh, primary school children back next month is the fact that vulnerable at-risk children who you will deal with in your role as a GP uh, in many cases haven't been going to school. Once they reopen to years one and six and, uh, 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 and um, other school children in primary, will you think, do you think that you'll see the vulnerable children return at the same time when they haven't been going up till now for all the period we've been in lockdown? Well, I very much hope so. Theoretically, of course, schools have stayed open for children of key workers and for the most vulnerable children, they have stayed open. But of course, as a GP, I know only too well that unfortunately, if there's one group of children who are less likely to attend school before coronavirus, it was those ones. But the Children's Commissioner has been very clear, 2.3 million children in the UK who come from vulnerable families, 2 million children who come from families where there's drug and alcohol abuse, domestic abuse, or parental mental health problems in the family. And for them, these schools can offer a real, real lifeline. Yes, I very much hope that they come back. We need to get the message across that the concerns do not relate to the children getting sick because, as I say, the evidence is that they are much less likely to be severely unwell. And the Royal College of Physicians uh, and child, Royal College of Pediatricians and Child Health said, you know, we can count on the fingers of two hands the number of children who've died. We do need to get across the message that for individual children, it is going to be safe. And actually, it tends to be the most deprived children who are losing out most because they are the mm. ones who are least likely to have a home where it's easy to homeschool. You must be concerned about the problems building up for the future when the kind of the backlog of the problems created uh, come to fruition. I'm very concerned for children if they lose out on schooling, but we're very concerned for people who are not going into A&E, not contacting their GP. We have seen, seen numbers rise of people going back to A&E. They are about at the level, I think, that we would hope they would be. But certainly in the first month or so, there was a 50% drop even in people going in to 99 or calling 999 for chest pain. That means that people with very serious illness weren't going in. We do need to stress GP surgeries, the doors may be closed, but the surgeries are very much open. If you've got a medical problem, ring up. Your GP can talk to you and can tell you whether you need to be seen or what needs to be done. OK, uh, another question on uh, shielding, uh, if I could bring both of you in on this. It's from Sheila. She says, I am shielding. Do I have to allow a gas safety engineer access to my property? Um, if I can start with you, Chris. Quick answer, no, you don't have to let them in when, you, when you're shielding. These uh, routine gas safety checks are going on. And a lot of people would argue, importantly so, because people are spending a lot more time in the home for obvious reasons. That means that gas safety within each home is important. But if you're shielding, you don't have to have people coming in to do this. You should have a chat with your landlord and explain the situation that you're shielding and arrange for this routine check to be postponed for a time when you're no longer shielding and happy days come around. Sarah, what's your general advice to people who have emergencies in the home and they are shielding? What, what are you supposed to do? Is there any way around it? Yes, so if you are shielding, if you're living with somebody else, then it should be relatively easy to let some, to get them to let somebody else in. If you're in a completely different room, then you want to let the person in to be only in the room that they need to be in because, of course, they could theoretically contaminate a surface. But you want to make sure that they wash really carefully when they come in, that you say very strictly in a separate room from them, and that you are, even if you are shielding, really scrupulous about washing your own hands when you're in the home because once they've gone the biggest risk for you is going to be you touching a surface that they may have contaminated and on that issue of surfaces in that situation or, or for anybody really if somebody's coming into your house what should you that's lying around the house be cleaning surfaces with we know how to wash our hands now but different surfaces need different cleaning products what what are effective against this coronavirus 
Yeah, it's difficult. Well, of course, this does have a fatty outer layer and therefore really anything that causes a, a foam, anything that disrupts that outer, outer fatty layer will disrupt the virus, so any detergent. But clearly, you're not going to want to use the detergent on your very best chairs. Um, so in those cases, we think that it can survive on plastic and on glass for and on metal for up to three days. So with those ones, I would suggest a bleach-based spray or a detergent-based spray. OK, some great practical advice, Dr Sarah Jarvis and your beautiful chair. Thank you very much for joining us once again this evening. Uh, Chris, if I can uh, just end with a couple of questions about the workplace. Um, somebody who didn't want to give us their name said, how do I report an employer for asking their employees to work while I'm furloughed? It's not the first time you've been asked this, is it? No, it's not. And this uh, whole scheme is administered by HMRC. Um, and if they find malpractice going on, they can take action, even clawing back money. There is a mechanism for workers to raise concerns. They can do that using the tools on the HMRC website. And indeed, you can do it without leaving your name, acting as a whistleblower and there can still be action. Oh, OK, that's really good advice. Susan says, I worked on a makeup counter, but I have been furloughed. My employer wants me to go back to work, but they are suggesting that I will be going back to work as a warehouse operative in a new distribution centre to fulfil online orders. Is this something an employer can do? A, a complete change of job there for uh, Susan. Or is it? Uh, it will depend on the detail of the individual employment contract that Susan has signed, because some uh, do allow this kind of flexibility. Uh, roles within a certain scale within the organisation are not uncommon. Um, so look, first of all, at what the contract says. If you still, Susan, feel that you can't do the new role, uh, perhaps physically not, then there could be some grounds to object under discrimination regulations if you feel physically you can't do it. If you've got the kind of job uh, that is very bolted down to one particular role, the unfortunate thing, of course, is that that role may not be possible, may not exist, which will really limit your options in this workplace. Mm. A brave new world for all of us. Uh, Chris Choi, thank you very much as ever. Thank you. And that's all we've got time for on tonight's edition of Coronavirus Q&A Online. Join me and Chris and Dr Sarah Jarvis again at 8.30 next Monday. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.